What is up crew, it's your boy KSM, and on today's stream we're going to be talking about how to draw your characters in perspective, and I'll be showing you how to lay out your perspective grids, we'll talk a little bit about the basic structures and forms, and of course, we'll throw in a little bit of foreshortening, the forbidden F word that a lot of you artists might be scared of. Today's stream is going to be really fun, I hope you guys enjoy this full process uh, full process drawing that we're going to be doing, and if it's your first time here, my name is KSM, I'm a Filipino art streamer here on Twitch, I teach everything from anatomy, gesture, perspective, to character design and I also currently work full-time in the animation industry for the studio that made Castlevania so if you are interested in some free art education or my dog who is sleeping over there make sure to follow subscribe on YouTube all of that stuff and I hope you guys enjoy today's stream <sighs> there you go easy man I'm getting good with these ad-lib YouTube intros we're getting we're getting pretty solid on these all right so one of the first things I want to call out here is when it comes down to drawing characters in perspective, oftentimes I see a lot of people get fixated on this idea of KSM, uh, how should I learn the one point perspective, two point perspective, three point, four point fisheye lens, five point perspective, blah, blah, blah. And they're all so fixated on these numbers and trying to get all these crazy things. When in reality, the first thing and arguably the most important thing about perspective is this this letter right here. HL, all right? And I'm not talking about hot ladies. I'm talking about the horizon line, all right? So what, what is the horizon line exactly? The horizon line basically is the eye level, okay? So whatever the viewer's camera, the viewer's eye level is, that is going to be where the horizon line is. And the horizon line is going to dictate whether or not you are seeing something above or below the horizon line, all right? So you could imagine if there was a box above the horizon line, what you would be seeing is the upper portion on top of that box, right? Let's just do a a um, a kind of square, right? So let's just take a piece of paper and let's put that in perspective here. So you could imagine there's a floating piece of paper here. And then if we did that going down, you got another like floating piece of paper right here, right? So there you go, floating pieces of paper, easy peasy. And you can easily take these floating pieces of paper, bring them down, and you can imagine now they're a box, okay? So we have all of that there, right? So we got a box, all of that. Now what's really cool about the horizon line, other than just you being able to plot points here in perspective, is that the horizon line actually also dictates how much further something away is from a person. So here's an example, okay? So obviously, horizontally, you can put stuff further and further away from the center of your image, and that'll kind of skew the image more. So if you put like a box here, that'll kind of move it further away. Um, but even vertically as well, the horizon line, I think this is where you can see the most power of the horizon line. So let's just say I take kind of this uh, horizontal line here. So if I were to place, if I were to place this, um, this square this piece of paper in perspective but instead of it going further away from us it's just going to be higher up right you're going to notice that what's going to actually happen is the the thickness of the paper or the width or the sorry the, the length of the paper is going to be the same right so we're just bringing it up here but notice how as you get higher and higher um, you're going to be seeing more of the more of the degree of the paper, I should say. So this is, there's going to be a term here called the degree, which is basically how much that paper is going to be kind of tilting in. Also, I guess you'll be seeing less of the degree. Sorry, not more. So notice how as it gets higher and higher, to match that same kind of thickness and length of that paper, there you go. So you'll be seeing more of it as it opens up like that. So as, he, as this something gets higher, it'll open up more. As it gets lower below the horizon line, you'll also be seeing more of the top line right so you might be wondering okay sam okay why is that important well this is important because this will actually let you be able to not only give dimensionality and form in the horizontal space but also vertically as you work your way up top here i'm gonna show you guys really quick how to rotate forms in perspective as a quick little demo and hopefully this will be uh, helpful to you guys as well so let me move this one here so here's how we're going to go and do this, okay? So if you take this uh, little box that we drew right here, and we, we just used uh, a rough one-point perspective and stuff, and what I'm going to do right now is I'm actually going to just draw an ellipse, kind of trying to hit all four corners of this box here. And so my goal here is just to make an ellipse, put all four corners, right? Boom, boom, boom. And now let's say, you're like, okay, Sam, I kind of want to rotate this box a little bit because I think it's looking a little plain, a little simple, right? That's fair. So here's what we're going to do. I'm going to choose how much I want to rotate. I'm going to say I want to put it like right here. I'm going to put that down. 
like so. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to try to find those areas right here. So let's just say we wanted to ro rotate like this, right? So if you go like this and kind of find these areas and these points, so using that, so first we're going to find that center line from the old one, right? Next, what we're going to do is we're going to say, okay, th from this point to this point, this is where this box now is going to have that cross section. Uh, and then from here, we're going to follow that. And that's going to be that new, you see this right here? This is going to be that new cross section of this box. So all we did was we took the form that we had and we basically followed here this like ring. Okay. Now you might be like, hey, Sam, I don't, I don't really get it. I'll explain. I'll explain in a second why this is OP. All right. So basically, if you can do this, you've basically established a box rotating in perspective. But here's the other cool thing. You've actually established two point perspective. And so now not only have we learned one point perspective here and all of that stuff, and obviously this is a loose uh, this is a loose diagram, so I need to kind of clean it up a little bit. But we've established not only the one point perspective, but we've also now learned how two point perspective works. And so you might be wondering, why is this so important? It's important because I want to show you guys that perspective is not about following the grids one to one and saying, okay, this is a two point perspective scene. So every single line needs to follow these two point perspective vanishing points. Instead, I want you guys to realize that in any given scene, there are an infinite number of perspective points that you can put, right? As I keep rotating this box across this ellipse, basically more and more points are going to be added onto this horizon line as you keep rotating. So don't get fixated on one point, two point, three point perspective, because in a scene, there are technically an infinite number of perspective points. All right. And here's also why this works so well. All right. If you if you if you literally take I'll show you guys right now. If you take this box right here, the, let's just say we draw a box. Right. And if I put a if I or so not a box, a, 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 a square. And if I just make a circle around this um, around this thing right here. You're going to notice that all I'm really doing is I'm basically rotating this box or this square in perspective, right? So I'm taking this idea of, of taking a square, rotating it along this circle here, which touches every single point, and I'm just doing that in perspective. Now, when, we, when it comes to applying it to a little bit something more complex like the human body here, you're going to notice that what I'm doing is I'm still keeping in mind the horizon line that we mentioned earlier, and I'm using that horizon line to actually help me visualize whether or not I'm going to be seeing the top plane or bottom plane of something. So here, for example, because this character is way, um, the knee is above the horizon line, we're actually going to be seeing more contour, more of the circle, right? So a little bit more of the circle up here of this of this portion of the of the uh, lower leg there and then once we get lower and closer to the horizon line notice how this as it gets closer the ellipse is going to shrink down a little bit so again this is going back to that idea that i mentioned er uh, earlier right about how the closer you are to the horizon line the more that degree of the uh the, the thing that you're seeing is going to shrink the further away you get from the horizon line whether you're going up or down the more it opens up this is going to be a hard concept to grasp. I, I know because it took me a while to understand this. But basically what I'm saying is this cylinder right here, if you were to draw a cylinder, the cylinder has a more open area at the top here than it does at the bottom here. Okay. Now, when it comes to drawing a character in perspective and drawing, um, uh, we're, we're drawing this guy right here. One of the best things that I like to do is I always like to establish first the most simple objects. Now, in this case right here, this guy, he's actually just sitting on a box. And so the first thing that I prioritized was actually the, the box in perspective, just kind of laying it out nice and easy. And that's that part's not complicated, right? Drawing a box in perspective, that's kind of like, you know, you just lay it out that way. I think it gets a little bit complicated when you start thinking about the form of the character. Now, usually whenever I'm drawing characters, I always try to find the points of contact of where the character is interacting in the perspective scene. Um, in this case right here, the character is interacting here uh, on the ground plane. So right here as, as this foot is uh, touching right there. And the character is also interacting with this box over here right and so those are going to be the points that i always want to focus on first because if those points don't make any sense your characters are going to look like they're floating in space so again this is just the basic rough structure 
uh, that we're laying out here nice and easy right nothing too complicated overall uh, I would say now a lot of what I'm doing is I'm just kind of freehanding this one right so I'm not actually notice how I've never laid down a single line like this I'm not trying to be like hmm does this line up here does this line up here and this is a part of one talking about the things that we understood earlier about how you can there's an infinite number of perspective points but also too it comes with a little bit of experience of just understanding like hey these lines are going to converge a little bit more and as they get lower and lower to the horizon line they're going to open up a little bit more as well so i am doing a little bit of that where i'm kind of understanding where things are working already um, but again part of the reason why i wanted to do this demo today was because i wanted to show you guys that you don't need to be super fixated on one or two point or three point perspective. That as long as you're following the general rules that we established earlier about the horizon line, um, that'll actually take you a much longer way in making more believable, uh, more believable uh, scenes, uh, characters in perspective and stuff. Okay. But all right, let's go ahead and let's lay out now the other box and. I'm just going to kind of rough these out again. I'm uh, I'm not trying to match the 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 uh, reference exactly because I don't really care too much about doing that. I care more about just kind of capturing the overall uh, the overall scene, the overall vibe, right? And so I'm laying in here some of that groundwork, and actually it looks like this one goes back a little bit more. So let me change that. Uh, but I'm just I'm I'm more focused about the overall feel and using that to lay out given my own perspective and stuff. Um, where do you start to build your characters? I've seen some artists start from the head, others the torso, others the feet. Um, I think it really depends. Uh, for example, if you're drawing a character in a scene, or let's just say you're drawing a character, you know, for fun and they're not really supposed to be in a scene or whatever. I think it doesn't matter. You could start with the head. You could start with the, the torso. You could technically start with the feet. I think there are advantages to starting in certain areas. So, for example, if you start with the head, I, I usually find that the head is the most important, arguably the most important part of a character design. And so starting with the most important thing could make sense. Um, but let's say you're focusing more on a dynamic scene and you're looking at trying to draw someone in action. In that case, I think focusing on the torso is actually the most important thing because the torso is going to have the largest volume in the body and will probably convey the most gesture based off of how the spine works and stuff. And so focusing on the torso in that situation might actually be better. But now if you're focusing and drawing a character in perspective, kind of like what we're doing here, I would argue that the most important thing is actually the feet. Now, in this case right here, these are more complex poses, right? So, like, I think drawing this character, not even in perspective, in this pose is already hard enough. Drawing this character in perspective, in an ant's view angle, where you're looking up at her, I think makes it even harder. So, it's going to be a little bit tricky when it comes to drawing just the feet. But let's say you're drawing a character standing in perspective and stuff. Um, I would argue that drawing the feet first and making sure that the contact of the feet with the scene that they're in is probably the most important thing. Um, but again, it all depends on your preference. Um, that's how I think about it. So obviously, you know, take it with a grain of salt and apply it to your own, um, apply it to your own preferences and style, right? Because you might like to think about things a little bit more differently than I do. But let's talk a little bit about now laying in this character in perspective here. So we have this girl here who's kind of sitting down and I want to make sure we're lining it up. We're going to be using this as a general reference, but we want to make sure we're lining it up to this character that is on the right. So not focusing on, um, I don't, I don't want us to feel like, oh man, we have to match it exactly with, you know, the reference that we're seeing. Instead, I want us to really double down on the idea here that they're, uh, we have our own established scene, our, our own established perspective, and that is what we're going to be um, focusing on overall. So if you guys weren't paying attention, the first thing that I focused on here, aside from the the arms and all that stuff, the first thing that I always focus on, again, is the points of contact. So right here, I'm always thinking, what is the what are the first things that are making contact with the uh, with the environment that we're putting our characters in? Right. In this case right here, the, the main thing that I'm seeing is going to be that that pelvis. 
So this pelvis right here was actually the first thing that I drew, right? I didn't, I didn't draw the floating torso. I didn't draw the arms or whatever. I drew first that pelvis because if you can get this part right and get this part to look and feel good, then you will know, okay, well, the torso is only a little bit further up from this pelvis. So let me go draw that next. And then from there, it's like, okay, cool. Let me go ahead now and let me add all the additional limbs because that just connects from the, the torso and the pelvis. So notice how the first thing I always focus on are the contact points. In this, in this example that we did here, I focused primarily on the, the pelvis again because they're sitting, but I also drew the feet next. I think my, my order of it was I drew, I think I did pelvis first. Pelvis was one. Uh, torso was two, then I did uh, foot was three, other foot was four, and then you just connect the dots. Boom, 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 right? So that's kind of how I'm thinking about it. Even for this one example right here, notice how I drew the pelvis first, torso next, then I drew the legs, then I'm drawing the arms, right? I'm kind of working um, externally from those main core, uh, main core structures. Okay. So let's talk a little bit about the anatomy of this character. And one of the first things I want to talk about, and, and I want to preface, by the way, uh, this is going to get a little dense, okay? This is going to get a little dense, but hopefully it won't be too overwhelming. But I want to make sure we hit all the points and all the, all the topics today. So one of the first things I like to always do whenever I'm drawing my characters, um, especially when it comes to anatomy and stuff, is I want to always make sure we're capturing the clavicle. I would argue that the clavicle is probably one of the most important uh, bones in the torso. And the reason why is because the clavicle basically is a major connector for many different parts of the body. We're talking about the neck muscles like the trapezius, the sternocleidomastoid. We're also talking about the pectoral muscles. It also helps and connects things like the shoulder deltoids and also connects to the something called the acromion process, which is a protrusion from the back of the scapula. So the clavicle is a very important uh, bone and also it's one that you oftentimes see in a lot of people. I'm going to show you guys really quick. Look, this is like hopefully Twitch doesn't ban me for this, but he see this? clavicle notice how there's a gap between right here for the sternum and notice how it protrudes out this way and you have that tapering down here for the neck all right please twitch don't ban me i just showed a little clavicle today on stream so from the clavicle let's actually talk about all the major connections of the body which i think let's actually start off with the neck because i think the neck is going to be the most important here so when it comes to drawing out the character right we're going to establish this connection here and right now i'm going to kind of connect the neck first and we'll, we'll kind of do this weird thing here where i'm going to do um, i'll draw the neck of the character and then we'll draw out the rest of the head after i've never done it this way but i think this will be kind of interesting so first we're going to draw out the sternocleidomastoid all right notice how i'm trying to shift the conversation right now strike one. Oh man so let's go ahead and kind of capture that sternocleidomastoid first right Again, this muscle is actually a muscle that connects to the clavicle, uh, but it also connects to the back of the ear over here. So it's a great muscle to know. Um, there's a few muscles here that I really want to highlight with you guys and I want to focus on. One of them, again, being that sternocleidoid. Uh, now, what's really cool about this too is it actually also helps frame the inner portion there of the, of the, uh, of the neck. And this is going to be comprised of the trachea but also going to be comprised of that hyoid bone that we've talked about before. Um, but now as we go down here, um, we're also going to have here the, the neck, and this is going to be the, uh, this is going to be the, tra the trapezius muscles, which actually connect from the back of the, uh, the back of the, the spine there. So the vertebrae of the spine is also going to connect to the back of the skull, and it's going to fan its way out across there, the scapula on the backside. But um, I, I'm not going to talk about that too much today because, again, that's we're not seeing it. It's not going to be there. And so I want to talk more about the main muscles and stuff that we're going over today that we, that we are seeing, right? Um, but next up here, I'm actually doing this a little bit differently today, but let's just kind of do it in this order. Uh, next up here, let's kind of draw that jaw. And again, if you guys don't know what the jaw or how the jaw works, basically the jaw here is comprised of the this bone called the mandible of the skull. And that connects here uh, from this portion of the skull, goes down. And there's a lot of muscles that basically funnel into this hyoid bone, which creates a little bit of that tapering, uh, the volume there under the jaw. 
but also kind of creates some of that shape that we're seeing. So oftentimes I see a lot of uh, beginner artists forget that there is volume here under the jaw. So make sure you add that in there. It's, it's very important and it really helps establish some of that realism if that's what you're going for. Again, even if you're not going for some realistic stuff, um, you can see here in you, even even if you're doing more of an anime style or an animated style, which is what I do for work, even just having a little line like this, having that little line there just to show that, hey, you know what? I know that there's a little bit of volume right here. Sometimes that's all you need to do. You don't need to go in here and draw all of this and, and all of that and all that shading. Sometimes as simple as putting in a line can actually go a long way in establishing depth in your scene to help give that visual like, oh yeah, we know that there's some volume there. There's a little bit of structure, right? So I always tell people like sometimes when you're drawing and stuff, you don't actually have to denote everything, right? So let's go back now. Um, let me go in here and... I guess I'll work on the face really quick. I'm just going to do a generic structure for the face and then we'll, we'll come back to it maybe if we have some time, but I don't want to focus too much uh, on the face right now because again, my main priority was going to be on uh, the overall anatomy today and I also want to do some more perspective stuff with you guys. All right, so let me go in here, lay out the groundwork for the head. And you'll notice here how I'm actually, all I'm really doing is I'm taking that mannequin that I drew earlier and I'm just I'm just kind of adding a little bit of form there, making it a little bit more, compli uh, more complex than, than what we had originally. Um, but I'm, I'm never, you know, I feel like, what's the word here? I feel like I'm not trying to go too crazy and, and kind of go too far away from the mannequin. I think part of the mannequin is to help give you form and structure. Now, I've gotten questions in the past where people have said stuff like, Kasem, every time I try to use the mannequin technique, my characters look and feel a little bit stiff, right? Put an F in the chat if you've ever if you've ever felt that way. You're like, you know, I saw someone do this mannequin and I tried doing it myself, but every time I try to do it, my characters, they, they kind of feel like a robot sometimes. You know, they kind of look a little, I don't know how to say it, right? They, they, they don't look as uh, as dynamic and stuff. So here here I'll explain I'll explain why first of all that happens. The main reason why that happens is because I think oftentimes people are forgetting what the intention of the mannequin is in the first place. The point of the mannequin guys is to give your characters rigidity. It's the point of the mannequin is to give your characters structure and volume, right? That's the whole point. So if your characters look and feel stiff, it's because that's what the mannequin is doing. That's that's the job. If you want your characters to feel less stiff, you need to be able to apply stuff on top of the mannequin that gives it fluidity and form, right? So when we talk about the shoulder here, and we're going to go lay out some of the, the foreshortening, notice here how I'm using nice curves. I'm using curves and straights to really help kind of sell some of the form there, some of the some of the gesture, right? So I always tell people the mannequin's job is not to make your characters look and feel fluid. If that is what your goal is, if your goal you want your set to look fluid, then you need to make sure you're practicing gesture, right? Practice gesture. Make sure you're understanding how to apply that on there. Um, but the mannequin itself, the, the the job is is to make it look and feel stiff, make it look and feel like it has rigidity and volume. So that's that's kind of what I wanted to say that uh, about that because I've gotten I've heard that so many times. You're like, hey, some wow, you use the mannequin technique. Um, but why does your stuff not feel stiff and my stuff does? And again, a lot of that just comes down to me using the mannequin as for what its intention is, which is mostly for structure and form. And then I go in with my own stuff here afterwards and I'm applying my own uh, gesture. I'm slowly working in the forms here. Let's go in here and let's talk a little bit about the structure here of uh, something called the pectoral muscles. Okay, so what's really cool about the pectoral muscles are that the pectoral muscles basically are going to connect and insert into uh, a couple places. One is going to insert to the clavicle here. So we're going to have the portion here, the clavicle uh, kind of fanning out this way. Uh, two is going to connect to the sternum over here. So there's going to be that, that muscle right here like this. Uh, and then three, it's also going to insert into the humerus bone right here. So that upper portion of the arm there. And so all of those things are going to insert like this, and that's going to create some of that wrapped out form. Now, when you have the arm uh, raised like this, like kind of like, well, how we have it here, what's going to happen is the, the pectoral muscles are actually going to pull up a little bit there. 
and they're going to go into and up and insert into that arm over here, right? As it makes its way into that portion of the arm, uh, what's going to happen is the deltoid muscle, which is the muscle there of the shoulder, so the shoulder uh, muscle there, that's actually going to go in and overlap the pectoral muscles. So what we're going to do here is we're going to take the portion here of the deltoid, and I'll explain to you guys the three places that the deltoid connects to the body and also what the deltoids do. So the deltoids are going to connect to one, the end of the clavicle here, so the latter, two, the latter third there of the clavicle. It's also going to connect here to something called the acromion process, which is the bony protrusion um, coming out of the back of the scapula. And then last but not least, it actually connects to the underside there of the ridge of the scapula. So these three sections of connection right there are going to kind of help you understand the deltoids, but also understand uh, a little bit of what they do. So the deltoids, there's going to be a posterior, anterior, and then a medial section all of those things are going to be correlated to where the where the deltoids are connected and they're in charge of a lot of the mobility and range of motion here of the arm but also in charge of raising that clavicle as well too so you can kind of see how you can use the clavicle there along with the trap muscles in the back so what's interesting going back here now to the anatomy is that b this deltoid muscle basically now also overlaps the the um the pectoral muscles that we talked about earlier so the pectoral muscles are going to insert into the into the arm there but the deltoids also insert into the arm and they're going to actually overlap the form there of the of the pectorals okay um so after we've established the pectoral muscles which we'll do on this side as well too uh, we're going to realize that again a lot of these connections are going to just wrap into the arm right here we're going to have the deltoid muscle which is going to kind of go in here and also create some of that shape and also the deltoid muscle, they kind of uh, connect and kind of uh, converge a little bit more on the upper portion here, upper front portion of the arm. So not necessarily on the middle there of the arm, a little bit more closer to the front side. Um, and so you can kind of imagine as it, as it starts to wrap its way around there, you'll see a little bit of that deltoid kind of curving more uh, this way. So oftentimes what people do, gesturally speaking, is they'll add a little bit of a line here. And this line, and a lot of these smaller details, is actually what's going to help you out a lot when it comes to establishing things like foreshortening and, and whatnot. Uh, but okay, let's talk a little bit now about overlaps and how you can kind of utilize this stuff for foreshortening. Now, the area right here underneath the bicep, uh, sorry, underneath the pectoral is actually going to be the bicep. So the, the bicep muscle actually connects here to the humerus joint, um, and they kind of sit in between the um, the bicep, sorry, the pectorals and the deltoids over here, right? And then on the other side right here, we're going to have the triceps in the back, which we're not really going to see. Um, but if you take a look at this reference, you might be seeing like, hey, Sam, what the heck is all of this stuff right here? So interestingly enough, right here on the in-between of the bicep and the tricep is going to be something called the ridge muscles, all right? There's, it's a grouping of muscles here, which basically originate and insert into, uh, into here between the bicep and the tricep, and then also connect into the forearm there onto the, let me double check if I remember this, the thumb side the thumb side here of the arm okay so that's kind of what's going on there now you'll notice that when i actually go over these um these muscles and these lines part of what we're doing here is we're also going to establish some of these subtle overlaps um, of the arm here because it is, it is in these little overlaps where we're going to be seeing a lot of the foreshortening so you don't have to actually draw um, everything overlapping, you can just kind of add in a few subtle lines and that should hopefully denote some of the structure and overlap of the form, right? Um, but going in here now, you're going to notice a couple things. One, this form right here, which actually connects to the, uh, the elbow, which we haven't drawn yet. So you can kind of imagine there's an elbow here. Uh, but this form is actually going to go in and it's also going to now insert into the thumb side. This is kind of what we were talking about earlier. So the forms are going to wrap around and they're going to connect to the thumb side there of the wrist. And you can imagine this wrist really kind of being a box like structure, right? So I'm going to kind of simplify it here to a box and we'll start adding some more taper there. So the, the forms are going to wrap around and that's going to also create some of that, that structure there of the forearm. You can see that right here now. 
And this is where you can start to kind of go in and be like, okay, cool. So we have here the elbow, also known as the ulna. And then we're going to start wrapping out some of the other forms there. Um, right now, what I'm drawing in here is going to be the extensor muscles. And those are going to connect on the outer side there of the arm. So the, the outer part of the arm there. Um, and they're going to also connect here below and uh, sorry, uh, next to the ulna bone right here, which is going to be the elbow, ulna elbow. All right. Uh, next up here underneath that. So there's going to be onto the pinky side right here. Uh, there's going to be the, the ulna, which kind of wraps. So not the ulna, the, so this is the ulna. So the ulna is going to basically make its way down to the pinky over here. And underneath that is going to be where we have the other muscle group of the forearm, uh, which is going to be the flexor muscles. I believe it's been a while since I've, I've done this review. So I'm pretty sure it's the flexors. But basically, that is going to be your structure of the forearm there. Um, again, you can add as much or as little as you want for, um, for this. But I like to kind of just add a few lines, which hopefully help denote a little bit of the form that we're working with here. So these little subtle overlaps that we have are going to be actually what makes it, what makes that foreshortening happen. Again, it's not all about the crazy forms. So the stuff here that I'm showing you guys, all of these little subtle overlaps right here, this one right here, uh, I'll, I'll highlight it in a more uh, broad red. This right here, the subtle overlap of the of the um, ridge muscle over the the tricep there in the back. This right here, the ulna over the flexors. These are very little subtle things that that again you can start to see help create some of the form and give some of that dimensionality, right? Okay, um, and here we're going to do the same technique. I'm going to be applying again the form and the anatomy, starting off with that ridge muscle first. And what's really cool about the ridge muscle is that muscle really goes in here and it basically just kind of creates like this wedge shape as it bends. So that's kind of nice. Um, but you can use that again to establish some of the structure and form. Um, the bicep is going to be kind of right here. Again, it's going to be inserting into the um, inserting both in into the deltoid or not into under the deltoid and the pectorals right here uh pectorals being the chest muscles right so if you guys have ever done push-ups before um you would know you would know where the where the pecs are so you can imagine a center line here of the of the torso and stuff so you can imagine the rib cage here the rib cage is actually going to be pretty compressed into the body right um but knowing that is actually going to help us out because here we can now figure out and establish some of the form here of the pelvic area uh this right here is going to be the abdominal uh abdom abdominal region of the uh of the torso making its way down to the pelvic region right here look this is going to sound sus so I want you guys not only to listen to me right now if you're if you if you have me tabbed out on the side and you're listening to me Fair warning, this is going to sound sus, okay? But actually, here, I'll, I'll, make it, I'll make it less sus. Here we go. If you guys go right here, okay, and touch yourself right here, um, kind of in the, the torso area, all right? <laughs> listen, listen, li look, 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 listen, listen. If you go right here and touch yourself right here, you're going to find something called the 10th rib, okay? There's a bony protrusion on the sides here of your torso, and that's going to be the, so the, the ribs are, there's 12 sets of ribs there. The 10th rib is going to be the one that's going to be farthest out, and it's going to be touching right here. All right. And what's really great about this is it usually is a great place where you're going to be seeing folding happening of the torso. If you're bending down like this, I know it looks sus on camera, but guys, listen, listen, you got to find the, yeah, you find the bony. Okay. That sounds even worse. And what's really great about knowing where that 10th rib is, is that this can actually help you again, figure out where to add that compression, um, for your character, right? So here we're going to put that compression, um, on this character, uh, right there on the rib before we add in all the other stuff like his legs and stuff there on the side right here We're going to be adding in the oblique muscles uh, And that's about it for the torso over here. You can't really see anything else. So we're not going to worry uh, too much about that. Okay. I Have trouble keeping torsos the right length. Do you have any tips for keeping the rib cage and pelvis the right distance apart? Especially when the spine is curving you guys want the easiest tips for drawing torsos? Here's the easiest tip I can give you, all right? When you're drawing the torso and the pelvis, think about two squares like this, okay? Two squares. 
Now these are just rough generalizations, right? Take this rough, take this, uh, take this two squares, stack them on top of each other. And then from here, we're going to go ahead and I'm going to cut this one halfway. All right. So what have I really done here? Let me go like this and kind of, uh, taper it out a little bit. Basically this right here is if you can draw these two squares stacked on top of each other every time, that's all you got to do. So you want to draw this thing, a character bent like this, draw the two squares. Okay. Rib cage goes here. This is the character's back right here. They're bent this way. Cheeks, booty cheeks, body stretching. Legs going this way. You see what I'm saying? There you go. Easiest way. Easiest way I can think of. Um, and the, 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 the kids, this is the character's back, by the way, <laughs> you guys are like, what the heck is this? Uh, this is the character's back right here. So you can imagine there's a scapula, uh, a scapula right here, shoulder blades, right? Uh, the spine bends a little bit this way like that. You got the 10th rib going here, body stretches, pelvic bone. There you go. Uh, for some reason, boxes as guidelines aren't for me. I like to draw the contour lines more than things will go from there. And that's fine. I mean, again, right? I always tell people there are so many different ways to draw. Um, so many different ways to draw your characters, whether you do boxes, whether you do more spherical stuff. And I always tell people that sometimes there are use cases where things are better than than others, right? I've gotten this question all the time where people are like, hey, Sam, I keep trying to do the mannequin technique, but for some reason, my characters look too stiff. And the answer to that question is, hey, what do you expect? Because the mannequin technique is supposed to make your characters look stiff. It's supposed to give your characters structure and rigidity and volume. And so if you're expecting it to not do that, you're, you, you're not using that structure correctly, right? If you're looking for more of a flow and more of an organic feel, then what you're going to want to do is you're going to want to use more gestural lines. You're going to want to use more of the cross contours, more of the volume and stuff. And so different techniques will have different use cases. Um, personally, whenever I'm drawing something that's a little bit more dynamic and stuff, I don't use boxes. I don't use mannequins. I use more gesture, right? So if I'm drawing something for myself, um, Here's an example. Maybe I'll draw, I'll draw a character. Uh, let me think here. I'll draw a character kind of crouched like this. Maybe what I'll do is I'll do more of a rough gesture, right? Here's the, here's that rib cage. Maybe the pelvis is like this. Um, and then maybe I'll have the knees going this way, right? The legs going here. And then I'll have, uh, this knee maybe going a little bit more forward like this. Like the character is like squatting or something like that, doing that doing that Asian squat, right? Um, and so for the stuff like this, I'm keeping it nice and loose, right? Keeping that gesture of the, uh, more of the focus there, right? So I'm not really using the, the, the structure of the boxes and the mannequin and stuff. But if you're doing something like, let's say in perspective, then I think with perspective, it's more important, I think to, or it's not more important, but it's easier to use stuff like boxes because those boxes inherently naturally have perspective in them, right? It's easier to define a perspective of a box than it is to define a perspective of the sphere, right? Like the sphere is so ambiguous. This could be your uh, center line. This could be your center line. This could technically be your center line. And so I personally think if you're going to do stuff in perspective, boxes are easier. But if you're going to be doing more gestural dynamic stuff or whatever, um, then maybe boxes might not be the, the solution you're going for. Right. So hopefully, hopefully that, that makes sense. And, and again, I think it's a great call out because I think I hear this question all the time where it's like, I don't really like this technique or I, I, I much prefer this or for whenever I try to do that technique it never turns out right. And it's maybe because that technique is, you know, used for something else. Right. Um, so yeah, again, I think it's, it's great. There's no rules, have fun, explore, explore what makes the most sense to you. And, uh, yeah. Um, but let's go talk about the leg anatomy here because I think the leg anatomy is really fun. Um, so here we go. All right, let's go talk about some of the leg stuff here. So you can't really see the knee here or actually, hmm. Let's go do this leg first. Here is what's going to go on with, uh, with the knee. So when it comes down to the actual structure here of, uh, the knee, first of all, we're going to have the the connections of the 
um, of the quad muscles here. So I'm going to kind of add a little bit of form here just to kind of give it some volume. And the interesting thing is that the quad muscles, which are going to be connecting to the pelvis and all that stuff, these are actually going to kind of go in and work their way into the forms. Uh, let me go back right here. Well, work their way into the forms of, of the pelvis. And so I'm going to add a little bit of an overlap here just to kind of give it some depth, right? Uh, and then we're going to wrap its way all the way here. And let's talk mostly about the knee today, all right? <laughs> thank you for all the, thank you for all the support today. Damn. Appreciate all the subs. All right. So let's, let's work on, uh, let's work on this and this uh, knee right here. So there's a couple things going on here with the knee. All right. So the first thing here is you're going to have this, uh, Pentag pentagonal pentagon shape right here and this is going to be known as the patella also known as the kneecap now what's interesting about the knee is that the knee is actually a joint it's not one singular thing so the knee is actually comprised of connections of the patella with stuff like the tibia bone the femur as well it's also going to have connections of the muscles of the quad muscles as well as some of the intrinsic stuff and stuff like the uh sartorius muscle so this is something that i learned i realized when i was studying anatomy that hey the knee is not just one singular thing. The knee is actually a, a, a series of things coming together to make this uh, joint that we have over here. So one of the things I like to do is I like to first establish the patella bone because that's going to be the most uh, prominent, right? That's going to be that kneecap that we have right here. So let's go in. Let's gonna, let, we're going to lay out the, uh, the kneecap there. And again, we're going to be utilizing those same techniques that I mentioned earlier about foreshortening, right? So first of all, let's kind of go in and figure out what's going on here with the leg. So we're going to have some overlap right here because at this stage, you're going to have the hamstring muscles kind of inserting into the back of the knee right here. And so you're not really going to see a lot of that volume. But instead, what we'll see here is I'll actually, I'll actually raise it up a little bit higher. Um, instead, what we're going to see is we're going to see some of that tendon here as it connects down to the back there of the calf muscles, right? And here we're going to have a few connections going in from the sartorius to the gracilla, all these muscles, but let's not worry about that. Instead, I'm going to simplify it as a general kind of muscle grouping here. All right. So you can imagine some of that there. Now, when it comes to the knee, the knee is going to have a couple of bony protrusions, but I always tell people the main things to remember about the knee is that the knee actually has some fat pads right here. So there's a little fat pad right there um, and also a little bit on the other side too. So we're going to add a little bit of those fat pads there and that's going to actually help kind of give it some of that shape. But let's go down all the way. So we're going to make our way down here. And one of the interesting things is that the knee actually connects to something called um, the tibial tuberosity, which is basically, I think it's a ligament or a tendon. I always forget the two. It's one of those two there and it's going to basically connect to the tibia bone. Now, here's something fun about the tibia bone, and I'll, I'll explain it a little bit. So the tibia bone basically is this big bone of the leg right here, right? And the joint right here actually makes the inner ankle bone. So if you guys have never heard of the uh, kind of, you know, figuring out what that inner ankle bone there, that's actually comprised. Actually, no, sorry. That's comprised of your fibula. That's the inner side. Hold on. Give me a sec. Fibula is outer. Tibia is inner. Yeah. Okay. So this is the tibia. The fibula is on the outer side. And so instead, what we can do is this, right? We can kind of bring this down here. We'll bring that. We'll bring that tibial tuberosity to the to the tibia bone there. Uh, we're gonna add here some uh, some outer muscles. So this is gonna be the tibialis anterior uh, or anterior tibialis, I believe. Mm, wow, it's been a while since I've done this anatomy. Let me double check. Tibialis anterior. So that's gonna kind of go in here. It's gonna wrap into the inner portion there of the leg. And you can kind of start seeing here, now we're getting that leg structure, right? We're getting that common leg structure here, wrapping of the forms, a little bit of a tapering right here. And then from here on the inner side is where I'm gonna actually be denoting a, a little bit of the lines there. Now this right here um, on the back side of the leg is where the calf muscles are. And those are gonna be comprised of two muscles, the gastronemius and the uh, soleus muscle, but you can kind of see what I'm doing here is I'm adding in these subtle lines, right? I'm not, I'm not denoting everything, but just adding in a few subtle lines to showcase that, Hey, we know what's going on here. There's a little bit of a hard bone, right? Of the, of the tibia as it kind of goes there and creates the shape of the, uh, the shape of the ankle there, right? It's not just a simple, 
uh, simple transition, there is definitely a line there that kind of helps create and shape some of the form of the leg. You get what I'm saying? Protrusion and hard in one sentence? Yeah. Yeah, man. This is how I draw feet, okay? First of all, I like to group the, the three main toes there. Uh, pinky toe can go kind of in the back right here. Uh, this is a bit of a foreshortened piece or foreshortened, uh, foreshortened pose. So let me actually pull out that. Uh, we're going we're gonna to move the toes up a little bit here. And um, we're going to do some of that. And then here, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go find, I'll show you guys really quick. It's, it's, it's kind of easy, actually. So you're going to go in here. You're going to define the big toe as a, kind of like a step ladder. You're going to go one, two, uh, and then that's about it. One, two, buckle my shoe. Okay. So you can kind of imagine that's the big toe there. Uh, easy peasy. Let's put in um, a little bit of a curve there and a little bit of a... Uh... All right. So I'm adding in the three toes here, adding in a little bit of overlap each time, right? Overlapping the toes. Boom, boom, boom. Uh, I'm gonna add a little bit of depth here for the he um, for the portion up here of the foot before it kind of goes down and and bends into that uh, section of the foot there. Sometimes it's very, it's sloped for some people. Sometimes it's not. Um, so it all depends on your on your preference. We're gonna go in here and kind of add a little bit of a of a curve of overlap there, so we have a little bit more of the ankle. And then let's go do that one final toe, and that's about it for uh, for feet. So let's actually talk about how to simplify shapes and stuff in perspective, because I think this is actually an easy, fun technique you can do. So you can see, for example, that this reference image that we have here, it's pretty complicated, right? There's a lot of uh, there's a lot of detail going on here with this with this character or not this character, this scene. And so sometimes one of the things to do is you can actually simplify it out first. So before we even jump into drawing all of the uh, the details of this chair and the stool, let's actually just simplify it down to a, a rectangular form. Now, again, as I mentioned at the beginning of the stream, when it comes to learning perspective, what's actually the most important thing is not going to be all the one point, two point vanishing points, all of that stuff. The most important thing to learn, especially as a fundamental of perspective, is actually going to be the horizon line. Because if you can master the horizon line, you can understand both vertical and horizontal depth. You can then be able to create uh, vanishing points of however you like. Um, and I think overall, it's going to also help you with composition. So I think mastering how the horizon line works, which is, again, the eye level, right? So it's what the viewer sees at eye level, is going to be, I think, one of the most important things here. Um, so here's a simplified vo uh, form of this uh, stool, I guess, that, that, that they're sitting on. If you wanted to complicate it further and kind of give it more of that structure, we can actually go in now and, and carve out that stool uh, from what we have here. So I, I was originally just going to draw the stool out, but I realized that it might be beneficial for some of you to see, uh, to see here me drawing out this whole thing. But you can kind of see what I'm doing right now is I'm, again, just moving some of those forms, but I'm staying within the bounds of this box uh, that we've established here. So I'm not, honestly, I don't think I'm really doing too much crazy stuff right now. I'm just taking that box and I'm kind of carving out here all the underlying structure uh, that existed for this like stool that we have here on the side, right? So again, the chair, the chair is complicated, but look at kind of how I'm, I'm showing you guys right here. If you start off with a basic box, right? If you can draw the box, basically the, the rest of that chair really just comes down to establishing the rest of that structure. So that's kind of what we're doing right now, right? Draw the box first, because if you can draw the box, the rest of this is really just carving out all the little details that we have here. So look at that. We already now have a, a nice little stool. So again, when it comes to drawing uh, characters in a scene like this, the most important thing for me is always thinking about the contact points, right? So here I'm going to be drawing this guy first, but what I want to focus on primarily is establishing the contact point there of the pelvis on this, uh, on this chair or the stool that they're sitting on. So by establishing that first, you're going to get a good feel for the volume there. And then from there, let's kind of draw in that rib cage using some of the techniques I've mentioned to you guys earlier about proportion and form, right? And so we're going to lay that out next. And here we've already have a good kind of uh, understanding there of that box. 
in perspective, right? He's doing a little bit of a twist. So let's actually maybe exaggerate this a little bit more. I'm going to take this and let's see if we can rotate it a little bit. Um, but yeah, let's go back in here now. And let, now that we've established again, the, we've established all the, the, the basic forms. This is where you can kind of go in now and let's just say, all right, let's go add in some of the joints, right? So let's go here. We're going to bring this arm up a little bit and then let's kind of talk about the legs. So you can kind of see here how the leg, the knee is going to kind of go here. And we want to make sure to match a little bit of the proportion that we're working with, but I'm going to focus on establishing that knee first in the foreground. And then everything else, like the, the volume here of the quads and that upper leg muscle, we're going to just simplify that now as a rounded form of a cylinder. So we're going to go in here, boom, 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 rounded form of the cylinder. And I'll actually bring that pelvis back just a tad bit. But here's the, again, here's the structures that we're going to do. And here's what we're going to do. Uh, I'm going to also use the perspective that we have here. Again, I'm using less. I want to use this reference less. And we're kind of just using it as a general guideline. But I'm not too worried about the reference as much. I care more about the overall scene itself. So here, notice how I'm going to be using the legs here, right? I'm using the legs as a general kind of guideline to establish some of that perspective um, as well, right? Now, obviously, the leg here is going to be covered by the stool, so we're going to get rid of some of these lines here. Uh, but there you go. We've got all of this. I'm going to lower that knee down just a bit, actually. I think I want to make it feel a little bit more dramatic. So I kind of want him to kind of buckle his knee, uh, raise that down a bit there. And so again, this is just a fun exercise of getting familiar with the forms, getting familiar with the perspective. And I think that by doing these, these kind of exercises, you can really start to get a more com you can get really more comfortable with drawing the human body. Um, and uh, we can go from all of this mannequin stuff to the more anatomical stuff that we did earlier today, right? In a picture, the POV is fixed and the vanishing points don't move. How does it work in animation when the POV moves? Do the vanishing points move too? Yes. Vanishing points move because, again, this, is, this goes back to the beginning of uh, what we talked about for perspective. Perspective is dictated not necessarily by the vanishing points, but by the horizon line, right? And what is, it, what is the horizon line? Well, the horizon line is basically the eye level. It is where the character's eye level is. So it's where the camera is. So you can imagine in an, in an animated scene where the, where the person is moving around or the camera is moving around, what's going to happen? The eye level, the horizon line is also going to move around too. And so as long as you understand where the camera is moving and where the eye level is, you too can also alter and change the uh, the perspective and the vanishing points because the vanishing points line up on that horizon line. So that's kind of what I'll say about that. Uh, this is why I always tell you guys when it comes down to, uh, when it comes down to learning perspective, don't worry too much about vanishing points and stuff. Worry and learn more about the, the fundamentals of the horizon line. I think that's the most important thing when it comes to, uh, when it comes to, learning perspective. Um, when you're drawing something, are you cognizant of the initial line weight of your brush? Can you have too much, too little weight? Any other musings on the subject are also appreciated. Hmm. Am I cognizant? Um, kind of. Yeah, actually. Um, but that's something that I think it just kind of happens over time naturally. So what do I mean by that? Uh, whenever I'm drawing, uh, whenever I'm drawing something, here's a simple example. If I want to emphasize the importance of something, I'm going to use heavier line weight to make sure I to make sure I have nice kind of uh, thickness and kind of form there. And so a good example of that is when actually when I was drawing the forearm here with you guys earlier, I was showing you guys how I was, you know, adding in these thicker lines here for the outline and some of the overlaps. But when it comes to actually drawing in the components here of the muscles, like the ridge muscle here, uh, the extensor muscles here, and then of course the, um, 
this actually needs to go down, but um, the the flexor muscles down below, those are going to be at a lighter line weight because they're going to be interior, but also they're not going to be as prominent as sharp edges. So whenever I'm drawing, I'm always thinking about, you know, sharp versus or hard versus soft edges. I'm thinking about important versus not important details. I'm thinking about lighting versus shadow. I'm also thinking about uh, curved versus straight, transparent versus opaque when I'm doing my lines. And so I know it sounds like a lot, but I think it's actually something that just kind of happens naturally as you draw more and you start developing your style, right? Anyways, there you go. This is um, this is kind of uh, what we did today. We focused primarily on um, drawing scenes in perspective, which I think is really fun. Uh, we don't get to do this often on my stream because I think it's such a it's, a, it's a more dense topic for sure. It's a more complicated topic. Um, yeah, we have this one right here. We got, we got this one right here that we did earlier for some of these perspective poses, but all right, guys, do you, do you do character designing? Um, and you, do you have OCs? Right. So yeah, for those of you who are here for the first time, welcome in. Um, my name is KSM. I'm a Filipino art streamer here on Twitch. I teach everything from anatomy, gesture, perspective to character design. And I also work full time in the animation industry for the studio that made Castlevania. Currently right now I'm prepping to work as a character designer for shows like Castlevania, Legend of Korra, and Invincible. So if you guys are interested in some free art education, or you're just looking to hang out with my dog or some art stream here on the weekend, make sure to follow. If you're watching from YouTube, subscribe. And uh, thank you again for watching all of that cool stuff, guys.